Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. Aldo Tambellini was born in Syracuse in 1930, is an experimenter, agitator, and a major catalyst of innovation in the field of multimedia art. He grew up in Lucca in Tuscany and witnessed the horrors of World War II. At the age of 16, he returned to Syracuse with his mother. He studied on a scholarship at Syracuse University where he earned his BFA in painting. And soon thereafter, on another fellowship, he received his MFA from Notre Dame University. In 1959, Aldo moved to New York City's Lower East Side. He pioneered in the video art movement in the late 60s. In 1965, he began painting directly on film, beginning his Black Film series, of which Black TV was the winner of the 1969 International Grand Prix, the Obenhausen Film Festival. Aldo founded the Gate Theater, showing avant-garde independent filmmakers, and in 1967, he co-founded with Otto Piene the Black Gate, a second theater which presented live multimedia, electromedia performances and installations. From 1976 to 1984, Aldo was a fellow at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Since 1984, he concentrated on poetry and performing his poetry with video projection and music. Fred Gardafay interviewed him on April 29th, the day of his 90th birthday. Buon compleanno, Aldo. Grazie. Prego. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you become the Aldo Tambellini of Novantani? It starts that I was born in Syracuse, New York in 1930. My mother came to the United States, I don't know, 1925 or something like that. But at the age of 18 months, and my brother was about four and a half, my mother went back to Italy, and I obviously went with her and my brother. I grew up in Lucca, which is in Tuscany, in Italy, in a kind of a working neighborhood in Lucca. And then the war came, the American airplane used to bomb different places in Italy. And 1944, probably, on January the 6th, the alarm came up, and usually people used to run out from the house and go in some field nearby. But this time, since the alarm that the airplane were coming was happening so often in the day and the night, people didn't pay attention, didn't get off to the house. But I was outside under my building on a bicycle, and I realized that the airplanes were exactly flying over my neighborhood. And uh, I got off the bicycle, rang the doorbell. I lived on the second floor. I say, hey mother, you better get up because they're gonna bomb any moment. And at the very moment, the airplane dropped the bomb. I saw the, uh, the wall of my building opening up. My very neighborhood where I grew up was totally destroyed. I think about 21 of my neighbor were killed that day. And I miraculously survived a lot of people else were wounded. Well, that day was quite, a, imagine, a, a dramatic day. So what happened next? Did you stay there? From there, I moved with my aunt in, in the country. And then, a few months later, the German troops a young soldier moved in that neighborhood where my aunts lived. We were very afraid of them. The American troops were already in Sicily, and we are way up in the northern part of Italy. So it took quite a few months 
before we got liberated. The American soldier that liberated us from the occupying German soldier were black American soldier called the Buffalo Soldier. People came out of the house, embraced them, all glad that they had liberated in the neighborhood, which is one of the reasons I always been thankful to the black people in the, in the United States who were promised to be desegregated if we went to fight in Italy, but they lied to them. When did you know you wanted to be an artist? That I remember being an artist will go back to the age of three. I used to be very quiet and I used to draw, copying things from magazines. And uh, my mother, who was very intelligent and very educated, bought me, when I was a kid, Lanterna Magica, like a magic lantern. It was a projector that uh, projected slides and projected also pieces of film. I think that has influenced me when I grew up that I did experimental film. And also a handmade slide that I call Lumagram. So when I became about 10 years old and still in Italy, my mother didn't know whether to send me to music school or to art school, because I used to love to sing and I used to love also uh, listening to music from the old Vitrola, you know, the one they used to crank. And it was a special record that I used to love, which was about a, an Argentinian tango, which I remember all my life anyway. I went to the art school in Luca. How did you make the move from Italy to the United States? What brought you to the United States again? My brother got enrolled in the army. My brother had a degree in accounting. He was totally different than me. He was more conformist and I was not a conformist type of person. I came with my mother my brother was taken by the American army and he was stationed in Genoa. I came with my mother and I remember it very well. It was an American ship called a Liberty ship. The first day was the 4th of July. My father, he came to the pier and as we were taking the train going to Syracuse, when he was leaving, he was already talking over the separation. My coming to the United States was extremely, extremely difficult. I didn't know the language, and as I lived with her alone, and my father lived separately, and I was only 16 and 17, my mother became very paranoid, and uh, she thought they were listening device here on the wall or in the ceiling and she used to try to to protect me and I used to try to explain that there was nothing there but she became worse and worse so then the psychiatrist suggests that my mother should be taken in a mental hospital Mother, it is the night that came with the white van, three strangers dressed in white. And I, as a decoy, have tricked you into descending the stairs in the January snow, falling with whitest of white. The white van with the back door opening, parked by the ancient poplar tree 
on Jim Street in Syracuse, New York. The three men in white acting is a matter of effect, used to a routine that must be performed best in a swift way. You, mother, suddenly aware of what, what was about to happen, hope to my arm, pleading, don't let them take me away. You are my son. Don't do it. They took you away in the widest night to the state hospital in upstate New York. That is a night I did never forget. In your later years, you've been doing more and more poetry, which is interesting because you, as an artist, moved to poetry and a poet such as Lawrence Ferlinghetti in his later years became an artist. Let's talk about your artwork. I had studied under a masterful sculptor from Yugoslavia. His name was Ivan Mestrovic, probably one of the nicest people that I'd ever met in my life. He was also an excellent artist. You moved to New York to the Lower East Side in 1959. I always wanted to be in New York City, in Manhattan. I finally was able to save enough money and move in New York in the Lower East Side, in a neighborhood which uh, used to be an old Jewish immigrant people. That neighborhood, to me, looked like it was bombed out, like what I saw in Italy at the time when they bombed my neighborhood. My rent, I think, was like $65 a month, which is, is incredible to speak about today because of the rent the way they are. Then I met a young woman named Elsa Morris, and we ended up together for 10 years. And I moved with her into a store. I became very friendly with the Puerto Rican neighborhood. A lot of the young teenagers used to be on my store a lot. And they helped me to build an outdoor studio right after where my kitchen was. That's when I began to do sculpture and I belonged to a co-op gallery, which were called the 10th Street Gallery in New York and I belong to the Brata, and I exhibited at the Brata Gallery. How did you make that move from sculptor to videographer? Before doing video, I started doing film. I ended up working on film without the camera, just working directly on film. And some later on, I bought a, a second-hand 60-millimeter camera from a friend of mine, and I think I paid $300, and that's what I started using with filming camera as well. Later on, Still with Elsa, we started a place called the Gay Theater, which was on Second Avenue, where they had a lot of theater there, and uh, still on the Lower East Side. And we were showing experimental film, what was called then underground film, including sometimes some of my film. We used to make a, a compilation of experimental film. But I also became a friend with Taka Imura, who was from Tokyo, Japan, who also did experimental film. And he took 
some of our experimental film to Japan, where they were shown son of mine too, actually. It was a, a different era altogether. We were building another culture which was outside Hollywood kind of people, which we were called underground film and so on. I was very active in demonstration against the Viet Moore. I went to the Washington March with Elsa when Martin Luther King said, uh, I, have a dream. My poor little children. I participated with people of the Living Theater, which was the most avant-garde theater in New York, and I was a friend of Julian Beck and Judy Molina. Around the time when I began not only to make film, but I realized that doing video was a different thing because you could see something on the camera right away, while in film you had to process it and project it before you were able to see it. So it was a much more direct way to experiment. So how did you get involved with the Italian American Civil Rights League? I was showing some performance in some place of say New York and I had heard that there was an Italian American Civil Rights League but I had never seen anything. So we stopped at one of the meetings and there was Joe Colombo and the report of Steve Yellow talking about the difficulty of being in Italian America in New York, which I fully share and so did Elsa. There was a lot of pressure against Italian America those days. So I came back to the meeting which were once a month, and I know how hard it was to be an artist, and more than that, to be an avant-garde artist. So I participated in demonstration against the FBI, Edgar Hoover. I, I became more political. Then I also became friend with a German artist named Otto Pina. Otto and I founded a place upstairs from the Gate Theater, which we call the Black Gate, where we had uh, installation and performances. And, and people sat on cushion on the floor, not on chair. I don't know how to explain, but there was a lot of activity around that particular time. I don't think New York is the same now at all. When did you get invited to MIT? Otto Pina, who became a friend of mine, became a fellow at MIT, which was under an artist named George Kepish. When George Kepish retired, he became a head of the Center for the Men's Social Study. He invited me to be one of the fellows at MIT, which I was for eight years. I always wrote poetry all the while, I never thought of reading publicly. When I was still in New York, I became friends with a group of black poets who lived on the second street where I was living, Ishmael Reed, which became quite well known later on. It was in my first performance. When I came uh, to MIT, I made friends with other black poets and I started to read publicly. You, who more than once survived, daring to steal one more kiss from that seductive lips. You who many times was blind there from the moon total eclipse fiery edges, the hidden sun energy burning with visions. You who believe that creativity and freedom are as essential as breathing oxygen is for life, witness the conquering barbarian invasion. 
you who once sang childhood song to the wind, the melody blown away with old war memory dust. I know you've had many exhibitions of your work. We'd like to highlight some of the most important. The Black TV Project, which was an installation in Berlin. Black Matters, which was a solo exhibition at the ZKM, Center for Art and Media in Germany. Retracing Black, a multimedia installation at the Tate Modern in London. Aldo Tambellini, We Are the Primitives of a New Era, is another one of your exhibitions. What does the future hold for you? Uh, the future? Well, for many years, I was interested in the universe. We live in a little tiny planet called the Earth. It's very, very small dot in relation to the universe. I have become more interested in outer space in the relationship between science and art. And I would say that in the future, when we will go in space to Mars, which I think is an important thing, because first we went to the moon, which was in another space, and uh, the cosmonaut from Russia, the first uh, human that went uh, into space, describe space as being in black. A lot of my artwork deals with black. And also other American astronauts that went in space, they also describe space as being black. That to me is very important that kind of idea because black is usually a negative thing in, in other words and one of the reasons why there were prejudice against the black races they were taken from Africa to the United States so black has a lot of diverse meaning to me actually so it's a very complex and important question what I think of the future the earth will slowly become destroyed by ourselves. And I know there is life in other planets and, and uh, the future will be very different. We are in a galaxy called the Milky Way and we have a, a black enormous hole on the top of our galaxy that the scientists through equation and mathematics knew they exist and only very recent they were able to photograph you know this black hole and uh, I think the more we realize how we depend on other things outside of the earth uh, the more I think I don't know if the artists will understand the universe not just the earth in other words uh, you're also working on a new book of poetry. Could you tell us about this? Uh, yeah, I've been working on my second book. And Anna and I have been editing. I'm hoping that Ishmael will write the introduction because I've, he's a black poet that knows me from the 60s in New York. And uh, he wrote the best introduction than anybody because he knows me as an artist and then when he read my poetry, he was surprised. He liked it very much, and he explained why. Today is my birthday, but it's also the birthday of Duke Ellington, which is 
one of the great uh, jazz musicians. And also, I found out it's also the birthday of a woman named Maya Zarin, which I met many years ago when I was at Syracuse University. She was one of the oldest experimental filmmakers she was. So it's, it's a good day. I was supposed to have a larger show in a, in a museum in Spain, but in Barcelona, but everything is closed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aldo, for your wonderful insights into your life, your work, your past, your present, your future. Thank you for interviewing me. Thanks for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.